All right, this is going to be a, kind of a beginner's introduction into the Quantopian research environment. Um, I've been using Quantopian for a while now, kind of just for, for personal use. I'm not professionally uh, involved with any kind of uh, quantitative finance or computational finance uh, work of that matter, but um, I have been using it for a while, even before Quantopian 2.0, uh, to kind of just do some personal research and get some more insights into the uh, some of the companies or some of the securities that I was looking to personally invest in. Um, and so because of that, I've kind of been using it in a sort of non-traditional way, uh, which is, I guess, um, focusing less on the kind of algorithmic trading side and a little bit more on the um, research side of the environment, which I've found to be just incredibly useful. Um, but so this is actually uh, going to focus on exactly that side, the research side of the environment. And I just wanted to um, kind of um, start publishing some of my um, research notebooks or just kind of some of the uh, work that I've done in, in answering some of the questions that I've had as a personal investor. Um, definitely just to, to share some of that work with the community, but also just to, to try and get some feedback for myself. And of course, not being uh, professionally trained or, or educated in this kind of thing. Um, it's always helpful when the when the community can uh, be there to critique some of the stuff. And and of course, if it can also uh, kind of do a dual purpose and, and provide some help for, for the beginners, uh, like I was a couple of years ago, um, then even better. So um, if you've never heard of Quantopian, uh, I, I definitely urge you to check it out. Just go to, you know, quantopian.com. Uh, you'll be greeted with, with this kind of, you know, very provocative and interesting uh, greeting field. So level Wall Street's playing field. All right. That's a pretty big challenge. But um, having an account is, is free. Um, there are definitely data sets and functions which are only um, open to the premium subscribers. But um, I've been doing along just fine with uh, the free data sets, which are absolutely incredible. So. Um, let's just get signed in here. Okay, so uh, let's uh, go to the research environment and set up the notebooks. Okay, so I'll go in this folder for the purposes of right now and set for a second. Um, so let me make a new notebook here, and what this notebook is going to be is actually. Um, a question that I had as, a, as an individual investor, um, even kind of from the beginning, and the question is pretty simple. It's take a single company and and uh, really just try to answer whether its valuation is based on kind of, um, you know, fundamentals, whether uh, that might be, you know, enterprise value or whatever might make up enterprise value and so on and so forth, or whether the company is kind of uh, just priced entirely or almost entirely based on public opinion. Um, and I think it's a pretty good question, no matter which side of the fence you're on. I mean, me personally, I've, I've always been of that um, Benjamin Graham kind of intelligent investor side of things where you look for the value and you look for the strong fundamentals. Um, but that's obviously not the only way to uh, find some alpha and find some profit. So um, there's just as much value in, in finding um, finding perfect timing in the swings or just finding timing in a, you know, in a growth stock or something like that and, and really leveraging that to the most um, that you can. So uh, this is actually going to be a study in taking a, a single security and trying to analyze that, trying to analyze whether uh, it's, it's actually priced uh, based on enterprise value and whether it's, uh, you know, priced on based on the growth of the business as a whole or whether it's, you know, generally driven by public opinion. So um, I will be publishing this um, at the end, and I will, uh, of course, give the link to the GitHub so you guys don't have to, you know, curiously type along. Uh, but okay, so let's first start out. So if you guys aren't familiar with the Jupyter environment, this is a Jupyter notebook, uh, and there's a ton of great tutorials online for how to work in this kind of environment. But just one thing to keep in mind is that it's nonlinear, and I'll show you what that means in a second. But so let's start out with the beginning. So first. Let's uh, define our symbol. So for the purposes of this, I'm gonna use a company that I'm uh, pretty familiar with and I kind of already know what the results are gonna be, but um, that's in part a way to validate this, this form of inquiry. So um, in the end, we can kind of compare that with our assumptions and, and see how close or, or far it was. But, so this is Transdime, Transdime, sorry. 
um, uh, aerospace uh, parts manufacturer company, uh, Strong Fundamentals. Uh, they have had some dips in 2017 uh, because of some short sellers, some market analysts, and some uh, stuff of stuff of that nature. But um, again, that's just kind of my belief, my opinion. So we're going to put that to the test. Uh, so first, we do uh, what we do is we define our stock symbol or variable, um, and that's a stock symbol. And then what we do is this is what um let's uh, just for the quantum environment. We have to actually define the asset object from that stock symbol. Um, and then what we're going to do is uh, define some dates. So, oops. Um, and what I like to do is uh, do an analysis start, analysis end, and analysis start short, uh, just because some of the computational resources that you're going to be using from um, Ontopian are going to be memory intensive, and you can even see this bar right here. Uh, this is how much research memory you're using, and as a free user, I would assume that once you hit 100, they're just going to cap you off. So uh, we're going to do our best not to cap that off. Okay. Um, and then shift enter will run the cell. Uh, that's what I just did. Uh, alternatively, you can just click right here. There you go. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna import uh, a bunch of stuff that we're gonna need for the notebook. Um, and I've kind of uh, pre-sorted and pre-outlined pre it here for us. But um, So first from Quantopian, we're gonna import our pipeline, which is where we define our data. We're gonna uh, import uh, running the pipeline and prices, returns, symbols, which are all things that we're going to use to um, query our asset here that we've defined, trans done. Uh, then we import our fundamental and technical data. So, of course, returns and fundamentals. It's pretty easy. Quantopian just makes it incredibly easy for you. Just kind of packages that all up in a nice, very simple quick import. And then we're going to also take a look at some psychological data, uh, namely uh, Twitter and stock twits. Um, so that's what we're going to use to um, basically use as public opinion or, or media volume uh, to determine whether the, the pricing correlates with that or not. Sorry. Okay. And the last thing we're going to do is uh, import our Python libraries here that are going to be pretty critical to us uh, figuring this stuff out. So PyPlot, Matplotlib, and it's going to be our plotting library for visualization. Uh, NumPy and Pandas are critical for working with uh, the data and data frames, respectively. And SciPy has a ton of very well optimized uh, just statistical analysis uh, functions and methods that we're going to uh, make use of. So just check that out. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do before we jump into any of the heavy-handed uh, analysis and just interrogating the technical data or fundamental data, we are just going to want to see what we're working with, right? So uh, first off, we're going to want to look at the historical pricing data for the company, for the asset we're working with. Um, and that's how you do that. Uh, the second thing is we might want to smooth out that curve because if you guys uh, kind of think about a pricing curve or, you know, just kind of a securities pricing, it's not very smooth, right? So there's a lot of jitter, there's a lot of noise in that data, and that's not always very good. So what we want to do is maybe employ some um, moving averages to kind of uh, help that along in case we want to use that later or just in case we want to make it easier for us to visualize that. Uh, and the next thing we're going to do is actually define the pandas uh, data frame, which is going to hold a lot of this information. So um, those are you familiar with pandas? This is how you uh, call a data frame. First thing uh, is going to be our uh, stock symbol. Remember, we defined it as uh, uh, trans time up here. Uh, and the thing, the data that's what we'll display is the prices. Um, and then we have our moving averages as well, just just to visualize it and see if um, there's a big difference and there's a big deltas that we might want to account for as anomalies or outliers in our data. Uh, so the last thing we want to do is uh, get the return information and actually plot uh, the state that we've just gotten. So um, the returns, uh, this is what that looks like. Um, again, we call our asset. We, uh, our start is our analysis start, global variable that we defined earlier. 
our analysis end, same thing, we defined that earlier, and then we plot the data. Great. So we can see that for this pretty long region of time, uh, I think a five year span, right? Yeah, five year span, uh, trans time has been going up. It has been steadily going up, but there have been some big swings. There have been some big swings during that time. So the question we're going to try and answer is whether those swings were um, driven by a huge or, or just a large tangible change in enterprise value, or uh, whether we think those uh, big dips right here, or conversely, those spikes uh, are were actually the result of public opinion and, you know, just Mr. Market kind of uh, rearing his head and, um, you know, doing that. So the next thing we're going to do is define uh, some data pipelines for the work that we're going to do and for the information that we want to assess. So um, in the panel published notebook, I think there might be some, maybe more, maybe less of these, but um, I'll walk you through that. So let's make a function. Uh, and this is going to be our fundamentals pipeline. So we don't want uh, we don't want the uh, the stock puts or the Twitter data that we uh, imported here earlier. All we care about right now is this fundamentals information um, and passing that through. So the very first thing is actually defining our scope. Um, and in our case, we're only going to be working with our asset right here. Um, so we pass Ontopian a static asset of asset. This basically confines it to just one singular symbol. Um, and just as a little side note, by the way, I hadn't seen this in um, most of the tutorials that I'd seen just in Ontopian or the research environment in general. Uh, not that it's anything unique or special, but I thought it might be an interesting case study to show some of you guys how to work with just one particular security um, and just, just really get an in-depth understanding of it rather than trying to build um, a holistic portfolio algorithmically, as, at least as a starting point, um, not to say that one's more or less valuable. Okay, so uh, I'm going to uh, paste some stuff here. Uh, just to speak things up, I'll waste you guys this time. Uh, so this is just kind of like a general fundamentals pipeline that I that I use. It's not necessarily um, perfect or holistically complete by any chance, by any means, uh, but it will give us a good amount of data to start out with uh, in terms of fundamentals. So let's move on to our technicals. And let's do that guy as well. So what do our technicals look like? Uh, we definitely want to include our returns because that's uh, something that we're going to want to kind of always be correlating against. And we take the uh, sentiment of stock put, stock put, sorry, sentiment of Twitter, and then the message volume of both platforms as well. Um, and then in Ontopian speak, this is kind of how you define uh, the data frame and um, the output. So this is eventually what our header will be, and this is the variable that uh, holds it. And I should have been a little bit more consistent there, by the way. Daily returns should really just map directly to daily returns, uh, just kind of like these do. Uh, but, you know, okay. Uh, and same thing with our front and balance pipeline. So we um, generally match our naming conventions or the headers to our kind of data frame to our variables. Uh, but for our fundamentals, what we've chosen is just some basic information, PE ratio, current assets, debt, you know, earnings, enterprise value, um, so on and so forth. And for this specific example, we're going to be really working with enterprise value. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, yeah. Okay, so let's make sure that runs fine. That's a shift enter, and it does. So now we're going to want to actually execute our pipelines. Um, make sure we can get that data and make sure everything runs fine. Let's do the technicals first. Oops. Looks good. And then let's do the fundamentals as well. Um, this is, by the way, in, in Quantopian speak, how to kind of do that sort of thing. Uh, run pipeline is the function that we up, uh, imported up here. And the specific pipeline, as we've defined it, is right here. 
it's uh, a function, but it's basically a data pipeline. And the start date or end date are the variables that we define globally uh, in the beginning. So that kind of makes it so that uh, we can rerun this analysis whenever we want. There's absolutely even a different stock ticker with different dates at any time. And all we really have to do is just kind of bother with this first cell and rerun the whole thing. So there we go. All right, cool. Uh, so the next thing uh, that we're going to want to do is now that we have our data pipelines, yeah, it's giving me some warnings. Um, now that we're going to want to do is compare some of those uh, more subjective um, data sources that we've just gotten. So fundamentals, a company's fundamentals, they're not subjective, right? They're objective. They're objective. They're quantifiable and they can either be wrong or they can be right, right? If you either calculate that correctly or you calculate that wrongly. Whereas something like um, sentiment from tweets, well, that's that's a little bit different, right? Methodology is um, dependent. Um, the specific algorithms, the specific, um, you know, sentiment analysis that was run is, is all very dependent on the methodology. So we want to make sure that our Twitter data and that our Stockwitz data is at least uh, correlating to itself, at least somewhat, somewhat logically, right? Because if there's huge anomalies, then we need to be aware of that before we do any kind of analysis. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is um, define, whoops, define a data frame um, from technical output. And then we're going to want to get a plot here um, and visualize some of these, these relationships. Uh, so the first plot we're going to want to do is compare the message volume between our two data sets, Twitter and Stockwitz, um, in this situation. So let's do that. Okay. So we can see that the patterns, at least visually, the patterns are, are pretty close, right? So Stockwitz, Twitter, they generally follow similar trends, but we don't, we can't quantify that yet. Um, we don't know exactly how close those trends are. So um, what we want to do is um, use something like a um, pre not pre approved, sorry, but like a pre-existing methodology uh, for mathematically finding a correlation between two data sets. Um, because visually, it, well, it's, it's pretty good, but it's not good enough. We, we want to be able to prove that. So in this case, in the example, uh, we're going to use Pearson's cor correlation coefficient. Uh, and that looks at correlation between data sets agnostic of scale, agnostic of a lot of other uh, features such as outliers, which we would otherwise have to account for. So in that sense, we're gonna uh, basically use a shortcut and and uh, see how close the data uh, correlates to one another. So before we can do that, is we have to actually um, transform our data a little bit. So those of you familiar uh, with NumPy may be familiar with this, uh, but we're actually converting um, the message volume to NumPy arrays and NumPy arrays in such that uh, we can then use a uh, scikit method, or the scikit stats, sorry, from the scikit stat, sorry, scipy, from the scipy stat that we imported earlier. Um, that's the Pearson's coefficient. So the last thing we need to do is actually visualize it. Okay, so we can see that the Pearson's correlation coefficient is, uh, if you round up, 0 0.9. So they're very, very closely related. And then the p-value is very, very small. You can see that it's to the negative 114th power. And the p-value is essentially um, attempting to quantify how likely it is that, that a mistake has been made in the computation. So it's, it's very unlikely that a mistake has been made, and the data is very, very closely correlated. And that's a good sign. That means that um, people are talking in the same general volume in Twitter as they are on Stockwitz about this company. And that means that um, this might be a reliable data set for us. Um, so the next thing we want to do is interrogate the sentiment um, because people might be talking on both platforms equally, but we don't know what they're saying. And we don't know if that might correlate to one another. So in the similar pattern as before, we define our sentiment um, as one part of the plot. And then we define um, the Twitter sentiment as the second part of the plot. 
So similar to before, we're also going to get the correlation coefficients and we're going to print that and visualize it at the same time. Okay, so even before these numbers popped up, you guys can kind of see that sentiment is all over the place, right? Um, it's not as clean of a visual correlation as here. Um, and, and nevertheless, though, we have our correlation coefficient to prove what we're visually observing. So uh, being less than 10%, this is only like a 5% correlation. And we even high, we, we even have a high percentage of um, possible error, something like 37%. But nevertheless, um, it's interesting uh, because you we would kind of expect uh, the sentiment of, of the messages on both platforms to be to be equivalent, but uh, in fact they're not. So, um, what else can we do to kind of interrogate this? We can look at the mean sentiment, and we can see what that tells us about both platforms. Uh, and so we see immediately that Twitter is almost doubly as positive. Um, and that kind of makes sense, right? Because Twitter is an uneducated audience and StockTwits, as its name might suggest, is a much more educated audience and thus, of course, uh, more prone to pessimism and negativity about the stock or the given security. Um, so it makes sense. But it also means that um, the sentiment may not really be a very reliable data set for us. Um, so we just have to keep that in mind as we keep keep moving forward. Okay. So the next thing we want to do is correlate what we've just seen to the actual returns of the security, right? And in order to do that, the first thing we want to do is separate the returns into a positive and negative table. Um, and the reason we want to do that is because we don't know if sentiment maps one-to-one -to, -one to returns, right? We don't know if message volume maps one-to-one -to, -one to returns. And actually, we might, we might know that it doesn't because message volume can only be positive. It can't be negative. Um, so therefore, we have to separate the data and try to find correlations uh, without those negative values affecting our, our, our computation. Um, so we do that. And then the second thing we're going to have to do, most likely, is normalize the data because um, there's not a direct scalar relationship between a lot of these numbers. When we're talking about sentiment, which is in the negative four to, ne to positive three range, versus message volume, you know, versus stock price, there's not a direct correlation. So um, we can just use a generic normalizing function and both pandas and numpy and scipy and scikit-learn, I might add, uh, have a lot of these that do these by default, that do this by default. Um, I wanted to kind of include the explicit version just, just for some of the beginners to kind of um, be able to interrogate it and, and see see how that makes sense. Um, so what this is going to do for us is, is remap all the values in the data set between 0 to 1 so that we can compare them um, much more easy, easily. Uh, okay, so the next thing we do is we take the absolute value of the negatives uh, because we don't want them to be negatives. We, you know, we want them to um, easily comparable values. Uh, okay, right, whatever. Um, and so what I like to do right now is just at a point like this is um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, is actually visualize my data and see what I've modified here, what I've been doing. So let's look at the negative returns table. So we can see that the absolute value has been applied to the table. Otherwise, these would be negative. We can see that everything else looks okay. Um, and then, so the other thing we might want to do is then actually plot that along with all the associated um, subplots. So let's see what that does for us. So right off the bat, we can begin looking for relationships. These aren't layered on top of each other, but I like using the subplots uh, function of matplotlib to begin looking for initial relationships. And as you can see, we can kind of spot them even in these first three, right? You can see the big spikes, you can see the big spikes. Um, we can see other general trends kind of appearing as well. Um, but so I'd like to do this uh, at this stage, just kind of um, to make sure that everything's uh, set up correctly and the data frames are good to correlate to one another. So, um, and then I comment them out like this. So, um, 
I can always go back to them when necessary. Okay, so let's start with analyzing our positive returns. So the first thing we wanna do is get a visual output, right? And see what that's gonna look like. And the things we wanna to correlate to one another are the returns, uh, the actual returns, the message volume from Stockwitz, and the message volume from Twitter. So let's see what that looks like. Okay, so visually we can see we can see a lot of a lot of uh, familiar trends between the data sets, but again we don't necessarily um, have a way of quantifying that. So what we can do is use the Pearson's correlation coefficient once again, uh, and we can loop through the different data sets and find a correlation to one another. So we can see that. There's kind of pretty little correlation, right, between the um, different data sets, especially with sentiment. I mean, sentiment to returns is, is very little. Uh, message volume is much more strongly correlated at 33% to Twitter and 25% to stock uh, That's not a, again, that's not a very high correlated data set, but uh, interesting to take a look at. Okay, so now let's do the exact same thing for our negative returns. Um, and I'm just gonna put all of this in here all at once. It's the same pattern as before. The only difference is the positive to negative returns variables um, that we defined before. Oops, what have I done here? Don't miss it. Okay, okay. Uh, interesting. So visually, I would at least say that these look similar, but our quantification tells another story. We actually see that, uh, if anything, sentiment is inversely correlated to negative returns. And we see that messages in both platforms are almost 50% correlated to, to, the, to, the, to the negative returns. And that's very interesting. It's very interesting because I, I think it, it at least validates some of the um, initial parts of the hypothesis that we set out with. Um, this, this kind of, not proves, but it, it, it speaks to, to the idea that um, negativity is much more strongly pronounced uh, in the media, it's much more pronounced in social sentiment, and, and it's much more uh, kind of acted upon in the actual market, right? Um, so unfortunate, but true, as the data would suggest. So let's get a final validation on this. Let's take, let's take the worst negative swings in a securities history, or in the history that we've defined at least. Um, and let's define that as a data frame of large negative swings. And let's get all of the swings where the daily returns were more than 15%. That's, that's pretty, I'm sorry, yeah. You got all 15%, that's pretty large. And then let's plot that against the message volume and get our Pearson correlation coefficients while we do that as well. Uh-oh. something there. Let me see. Okay. So we have the 15%, the top 15% worst days for owning this stock, right? Uh, Transdown. And we want to see what the correlation is between uh, data sets such as uh, sentiment and message volume. And we can see that those uh, correlations are decently high. Uh, message volume is especially high at 42%. And message volume on stock puts is also up there with 37%. So in the top 15% of the worst days uh, in, in, to own this, this security, we can see that that is when the correlation to message volume was, was some of the highest. Um, and sentiment, again, proves that it's not a very much reliable data set. Um, but we, we kind of already knew that, right? We kind of already knew that when we did this comparison between the sentiment of Twitter and the sentiment of stock puts, and, and we kind of understood from the get-go that this, this kind of may not be a very reliable piece of information. So what is the last thing uh, that we have to do? What's left over? So we still have to validate this against the company's fundamentals. We still have to make sure that a company is priced 
not entirely by public opinion, but also by a strong uh, value to fundamentals, right? So um, let's revive our fundamentals data frame. And let us visualize the pricing and let us uh, visualize it against the enterprise value. Um, and the great thing about the methods that we're doing here is that matplotlib is going to normalize the data for you. So obviously stock price and enterprise value don't map one-to-one -to, -one to each other, right? Um, but matplotlib is smart about that and it can display them on the same plot without worrying about that. So we can see uh, enterprise value is plotted in blue and the axis is displayed on the right. And price is tied in, um, sorry, red, and uh, displayed on the left. Uh, and regardless of scale, regardless of whether these scalar quantities have a direct relationship, we can see that they're very, very strongly correlated. Um, and that's, that's, essentially, that's essentially how we know whether a stock is priced based on public opinion or whether it's based on a strong public, sorry, a strong emphasis on, on fundamentals um, and otherwise is a good, good security to invest in. So the last thing we can do on this is uh, get a Pearson's correlation coefficient of the information. And you guys already know how to do that. So I won't directly put it on here, uh, but I might put it on the final notebook in any case. Um, that I think is it for this first one. Uh, maybe doing some more of these in the future. So let me know what you guys like. Let me know what you guys don't like. And hopefully this was um, informative. Uh, let me show you where this information is going to be in the end. So this is my GitHub, uh, MIT EVPI. And specifically for this tutorial, uh, we'll have it in Quant Party. And it'll be Mr. Market versus the Intelligent Investor. So I'll have it in a number of formats for you guys. IPython Notebook um, is native to Quantopian, but um, HTML, for those that don't have um, access to something that can render that. And of course, the .py for those of you that want to um, interrogate the code. Um, so this is what it will look like. Just what we saw here, um, a little bit more comments. So I'll paste those links at the bottom. Uh, of this video and yeah hopefully you guys enjoyed it thank you very much